Okay, welcome back. Kirsty's going to restart the recording. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Okay, so welcome back after the break. Um, see some more activity coming through the Slido, which is fantastic. So we'll weave those into the Q and A. So let's get back on with our packed agenda. So next up, we're going to have George Ta, who is the creator and founder of Jambo Radio. And Jambo Radio are one of the partners in the Make Your Mark campaign. And George is going to be talking about how multilingual volunteers broaden engagement, participation, and community development. Up you come, George. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I need to apologize that um, I've got a cold, which I've been struggling with since yesterday. So I'm not in my best of speaking today, but I had to be here um, because um, this is a very important um, conference for us. And um, I also want to say um, because of the cold, I've lost my Glasgow accent. So, uh, so bear with me, whatever you hear. Um, if you don't understand, I will explain later. <laughs> okay, so uh, when uh, Jambo Radio started, it was in the middle of um, COVID-19 lockdown. And the what triggered the beginning of Jambo Radio was the fact that the mainstream media communications on what COVID was about, what coronavirus pandemic is about, how it's going to affect all of us was very confusing scientifically, media wise. So, and then, and imagine that um, a friend or family whose um, perhaps English is not their first language, um, but they do speak other languages and they're struggling to understand mainstream media communications. How do they understand that? How would they understand what is going on? The restrictions, um, the science, and all of those things. So, so to start with, we needed to look at how do we explain this to um, our community? Because we were getting a lot of people reaching out in terms of um, uh, before the Jumbo Radio was actually a sector, we used to run a podcast and that podcast was talking about employability, career paths and all of that. We're not interested, we don't know anything that we don't know where. We didn't know if uh, COVID is going to come and when COVID came and then we were being asked this question through our podcast um, uh, WhatsApp group, which we used to share from different community groups, different community uh, groups of interest. And these people speak different languages because we're doing that in a bilingual way. And um, several of the guests that used to come on on the, on the, on the podcast as well were people that speak different languages. So we used to try and make sure that we engage understanding, broaden understanding on, on these different languages. Um, when we uh, Jumbo Radio finally started, the misinformation that was spreading on different WhatsApp groups, on different social media platforms, and reduced significantly in our community, in our groups, because there was a better understanding. And we had to get some volunteers on who can speak a multi languages. And if you, uh, anyone here is familiar with uh, the African and Caribbean community, um, I'm probably one of the people that speak less languages and I speak three. So, and so there are people here, I've come with my colleague Beto, who speaks like five languages. I don't know where he gets that from, but <laughs> yeah, so my brain can manage all three. And it's, so it's very important. So, so the, the, in terms of uh, how the volunteers, how we realized how much language, um, I think it's taking a bit of time to move, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So, maybe I'm not pressing it hard you enough. Okay. You just need to press it a bit harder. Ah, a bit harder. Okay, mm -hmm. that's uh, you know I'm a soft touch. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so it is very important that if um, the work that we did in uh, one of our projects working with the um, the heritage sectors, uh, the importance of how 
um, languages, language can be very useful. Have volunteers that speak different languages can be very useful. We found that in the course of our 18 month project, that was um, uh, which we, we work with uh, different partners in the heritage sectors. And how that also, um, because of the language aspect, how that uniquely helped us to engage um, volunteers and um, broaden engagement within the communities was the fact that everybody or most people, a majority of the community could feel connected with what we are doing. And it's not because specifically it's um, a, a, a Jambo radio for people of African and Caribbean heritage, but we see the need that it could also be replicated in different services, in different organizations. And it's opening up because just imagine that, um, a, you know, uh, someone walks in here and then they're trying to find directions that they're, they're probably not finding that direction, not asking in English, and and then you don't understand it, or you know, and then you have a colleague that understands Russian, for example, and then they can they come they 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 can help out with that. So you see that 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 connections is really important. So it is important to consider how the use of people who can speak. Uh, I'm going too fast. Uh, so this is important to understand, um, to, to be intentional in terms of how inclusiveness is considered, how inclusion is considered. Are they people that have, they might not have um, uh, different skills apart from the language aspect of it, but would that contribute to your service? You know, if there is a need, do you have someone that can, can assist, can support a service user in a different language? Um, without considering that, no, this is, uh, uh, you know, this kind of mainstream organization, uh, we can't use different languages here, because that's one of the things that we notice. But the important fact I need to mention here is we need to take into consideration that the society, our communities are changing every day. The last 10 years has seen a significant growth of the African and Caribbean communities in Scotland, especially in the, the centre belt. And that is very important. If your service provider there, how would this population, how do you want volunteers from this to be able, how do you want to tap into that community? The population is growing. There are a lot of people coming from different professional backgrounds, skills. They want experience. They want to volunteer. They want to participate. They want to engage. They want to integrate, but they're looking for those opportunities. So how do you connect with that community to be able to tap into this really pool of talented people that are in this community? And how would that community, um, that engage with your services so it's, it's it's very important to consider that the changes of the, the demographic sorry the demographic change is important to be considered in whatever we're doing and at jumbo radio um although we're using multiple languages as a way of a, a engagement because what that actually did for us was we had more than more than we can accommodate accommodate um, uh, volunteers because people were connecting with different languages you know whether it's swahili they want so at some point we had people we had them um, 50 52 volunteers on our volunteer pool and we can only accommodate 15 for the space and uh, the the activity we cannot get more than that but we had that amount. So, but because people were finding that, oh, they're connecting with a certain language, they're not, because they're not connected to uh, uh, specifically for, it was a language part that was actually connecting them. It wasn't the acti only the activity, but just because you feel that, you know, say someone there that speaks um, the language I understand, I can go there and they'll participate. And then after, you know, going on from that, there were people that taking part in sort of a Training programs. Uh, they started volunteering as well. I uh, participated in our employability training programs that we were doing, and also our activities that we were doing. And very resourceful people, who would have missed out on, had we not made that choice to use um, multilingual speakers uh, to deliver our services. So the other thing I wanted to uh, uh, mention is um. It's a how do we go about that? You know, I think this partnership for this conference, for this Make Your Mark campaign, is a very good platform and tool to broaden 
access to the various communities. And, and my hope is there will be more diverse communities that would uh, sign up um, on this and be able to provide access to organizations. We need to be able to partner together, but it's very important to understand what that this group, this community, what are the issues, what are the challenges, what are the barriers, why is it so hard to get volunteers from the community. I think there was a presentation and we talked about, um, you know, how less people of make uh, minority ethnic communities uh, are less likely to volunteer. But the, the point is, is, is um, if there are people that want to volunteer. They just don't know. They, they just don't know who they want to volunteer with and um, what the people are doing. And as the people approach them, are they, are they connected to me? And uh, if I go there, what sort of support would I get? You know, so there are a lot of talented people, but we need to understand the approach of uh, understanding the issues, the barriers is very, very important. In fact, the African and Caribbean community has the youngest population in Scotland. And these are vibrant um, kids that are born here or they've grown up here. They might have been brought here when they were like one, two, three, four, five years old, but they're now kind of adults, you know, but they speak different languages because they're growing up in a household where these languages are being used and they know it and it's very important. So when they leave, um, if they were working at the engine shed or they were volunteering here and they leave, they go and speak to their pa in another, or, or their, their parents or people that they're connected with in another language and explain what they're doing and stuff like that. And then those, that's where the interesting message of what is happening here can engage the community. You know, so it's very important, really good leverage to use as a way to uh, ensure that um, we can engage a community, a new community, you know. Um, so I'll give you a couple of the, yeah, okay, the, the time is up. I didn't think I'll reach this time, but it's okay. <laughs> so. Um, so we use uh, Yoruba, for example, it's, it's a massive language. There are quite a lot of people in terms of the, the, the demographic, the population demographics that speak the language is, is quite big in the community. And for us to, to be able to um, connect with this community, um, Kemi, whom you see here, is a nurse by profession, which means she doesn't speak Yoruba every day in her work. She doesn't go to the hospital and speak Yoruba. She doesn't work in, uh, in a nursing job as a uh, speak Europa. But the advantage there is she can talk about, you know, um, things in Europa to the community for better understanding. People can know how to access. If there was something that um, she was going to talk about in terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, what you know, her profession, her work, she can, stick, she can communicate that to the right audience in the best of their understanding because that's the language that they speak. That's the language that they speak after work. So it's uh, it's very important. Another one is Swahili voice. So again, it's looking at how the they, you know how this has helped in terms of uh, the integration process. Generally, generally, the majority of the population speak um, English, but English is, is depending on the standard or the level of engagement that they want to have. That will be subject now to. You know, how do you want to encourage them to participate? How do you want to, um, how can they contribute to your services? Mm -hmm. So it's very important to, um, to understand that. It's also very empowering to, you know, have someone that is within your organization that, you know, they can help somebody that speaks another language. They can, they can use that, the, 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 you know, the language ability to be able to contribute in engaging more people and empowering more people to commit to engage in the community in, in your activity. So basically, in conclusion, we have to look at the use of multilingual um, or multilingual volunteers as a really important tool in the work that we do. Very, very important. So I'll, I'll leave it there because my time is up. Any questions? Bang on. <laughs> Okay, great. So, um, as always, for the Q&A, we'll go to the Teams room first. So, is there anybody within the Teams call that would like to 
come off mute and um, turn your camera on if you like and ask a question. Do we have any thumbs up there? Yep. OK, Rachel. Uh, that was a fantastic, really inspiring talk, George. I was just interested to know if, um, you know, what the diversity of languages um, you have. It sounds like there's quite a, you know, variety. So um, just how many different languages are available on Jambo Radio? So we have, that's a very good question. We have, um, we currently use five languages. These five languages represent the population because the people, as I said, people that understand and speak these multiple languages. These are languages that are common among the population. So those five, the diversity of the languages is really uh, kind of, if we put in the context of, um, you know, how, uh, where these languages come from, it will be like East, West, South and North and Center. So the so these five languages that captures majority of the population the usage in the in the community and also capture the um the languages that are most used within the uh population and the community okay great thank you is there any other calls from the teams room a uh, question from the teams room nope okay doke. so any hands going up in the auditorium for live questions yep go for it entirely no. up to you i'm going to say to a benefit okay um, hi, Josh. Hi, yeah. Presentation. Um, in the past, I have had multilingual volunteers who are really willing to do translation, but comms professionals were very reluctant because they couldn't have any oversight in the material that was being produced. So they effectively wouldn't understand what the translated material said. So how do you ensure there's consistency and oversight, um, maybe where a volunteer manager doesn't speak or, or, or read the language that it's being translated into by the volunteer. Yeah. How do you sort of manage that relationship to ensure there's diversity of languages, but that everyone's on the same page? Is it translation? It's a it's a completely different ball game in terms of how organisations also want to run. Communication people are very particular about um, language usage and stuff like that. And when we say that use of language will be like, uh, you know, how do you communicate this in English and then how do you communicate this in Swahili? You know, the 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 important thing to to, to understand that I think I would suggest that if a uh, uh, if a volunteer is able to put um some piece of information in another language is that working together to to support them uh, so they understand the, the context of what the message is because it's uh, it's true it's a it's a difficult one you know it's a that's a very good question, but it's a very difficult one when you talk about Charles data. But the approach, our approach is just, you know, just leave people to do, to talk, you know, and express themselves. And if the, for example, the the, the COVID materials that we're getting from the WH or the Scottish government on, uh, uh, on COVID, you have to trust the person that speaks that language to be able to Put that in the in the context of understanding, but the impact the, the the impact is what's most important. Did that help to reduce misinformation? Did that help to um, reduce um, COVID skepticism? Yes, and that's that's for me that's that's the impact. But translation and communication people it's a completely different ballgame. <laughs> yeah, try to stay away from that. <laughs> okay. Um. Any more questions? Any more hands up from the room? No. Okay then. So. Yeah. Oh, we'll put a hand up. Yes, it hasn't. Oh, thank you. That was fabulous. Um, I just wanted to ask about partnerships with other organisations. Are you working with any other organisations where you think that this is a great partnership that's working really well for that organisation and also working for Jambo? Yes, we, we, we you know, we, we work with quite a few organisations. We work with um, uh, 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 Diggit is one of our partners that we, we work with and uh, and um, uh, other heritage partners that we, we've worked with. Um, so we look at, we, we, we continue to kind of explore those different things that we can, uh, how we can share even stuff, you know, we can share. Uh, I think uh, it's Jeff, uh, you know, uh, is here. Uh, uh, Jeff that leads the, the digital and partnership that we, we, we have together. And uh, we, at some point we've kind of discussed how to share staff time you know but it's only working that modality how they've 
continue to do the work that they're doing, volunteering at Jambo Radio, and also working, um, you know, supporting uh, a heritage project in terms of, um, the, you know, using that language and their skills and their talents. Yeah. Okay, great. So, where does the line between volunteering and fair paid compensation for the input of bilingual volunteers begin and end? Thinking about um, translation of guides, notice boards, etc. Do you have an opinion on that, George? I, it, it, again, that's a very good question, and it, it's really tough because the our experience of you know trying to support. How do you support these volunteers? There is so much that they offer. There is so much, like most volunteers, there is so much that someone who has you know the the usage of their language um abilities is contributing a lot to the work that you're doing to your services but how do you keep them going how do you motivate them how do you encourage them how do you look at you know um how long can you sustain or retain that sort of quality of person if they get opportunity to move on would are they able to move on and all those things so it's um it, it's, it's, it's looking at realistically, you know, the level of support that you can provide. And this comes out to, um, you know, uh, funding, the funding enough to support. If you have a, a very talented, skillful volunteer, multilingual um, volunteer who is very resourceful and you can see the impact of what they're doing in your services or your, uh, your organization. And then they have a challenge of a child care, for example. Do you have that resource to just support them? That's just one thing that they need. Otherwise, they will be, you know, they, they will stay away. So it's all those things. So um, that's child care. Uh, how do you also reward or remunerate um, someone who is that talented? You know, because I think the, the use of multiple languages, it's a, it's a talent on its own. And to be able to the ability to be able to use that in a in a service is it's 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 a wonderful thing. So how do you incentivize them? You know how do you do that? So it's it's always a question of down to how you, what sort of values your organization put. Okay, so kind of um, on that similar thought path, there's a question around about training and the offer of training. So would the uh, translator interpreter training for bilingual volunteers resolve some issues. So I assume that that question is around about could organisations do more um, when they're planning for uh, recruitment of supporting volunteers to actually put something in place and uh, say that we have a kind of industry standard training on offer rather than assuming that because someone is bilingual, they're going to have the skills mm, yeah. to do that. And I just wonder if that's something for Make Your Mark to consider um, around about maybe a training session and, and how do we upskill volunteer managers to pass that on kind of in-house? So do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, well, the thing is, uh, I, I, I've said it, um, like the, our approach was get people that volunteers speaking multiple languages. But I have to tell you that it's a screening process. There's a screening process. And it's because, the, you know, the, it's very important that there's a standard of, you know, of the usage of the language and um, the delivery of the service. So there's a standard. So there's a screening process, which is what I did not mention. Um, but it's very important that there's a standard. The organization can consider whether, you know, there could be some 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 training in terms of, a, a you know, how this multilingual person can contribute in your service. But that's something, as you say, it's very good that for Make Your Mark to look at how we work with partners who have you know, ourselves who have this level of um, uh, this quality of multilinguals uh, um, uh, uh, volunteers and what would they need? Yeah. OK, um, so we've got time for another question here. I'm just looking at uh, popularity. So how is a predominantly white organisation can we integrate into other communities to grow a diverse volunteer um, and staff? Um, and service user involvement. I mean, that's a that's a big question. I don't Pass. mean long. Pass. Can I, run? I mean, that's that's like 
you know, if they're, if that's what our sector, the heritage sector, needs to be so much better at doing. So, you know, that's a big question to end on. And I think one that we need to keep reflecting and pushing back on as today progresses. But yeah, yeah it'd be good to know your thoughts on that. You know, it's, I think, that are, are relevant. Being in those partnerships with the community, um, which organizations is out there that they can, um, and which community is there that you're, you're, you're finding difficulty to access? It has to be in, in, you know, a deliberate, intentional approach to really go and find a way to access that community, you know, and access that community can change uh, some of the challenges that um, white organizations are facing in terms of um, integrating different communities. But there's also a structural issue, which you have to mention. And the way organizations and organizations are structured, they've been structured like that years ago, but they are not considering now the changes of the population. So look at the changes in the population. You know, it's not just walking past members of different communities but you know there's a possibility that if you on the, if you know that if any organization knows that there's been change in the population in the last 10 15 years it's good to kind of reconfigure how would that now work now what is how is the population in glasgow represented it's completely different like it was 20 years ago so it's those services and uh, structures that were set up considering the community at the time, have to look at what has changed in the community, what has changed in the population. So it's very important. That's where this change has to start. Okay, and on that note, thank you so much, Joyce. Yes. Okay, right you. So that is us ready for the panel. So hopefully there's some good questions in your minds. There's been some questions submitted in advance and there'll be questions coming through the Slido. We've got half an hour for the panel um, discussion and I am not running the panel because Tamsin Russell, extraordinaire from the Museums Association, um, we immediately thought 
who could run this panel? Tamsin Russell is so upfront, challenging, says it like it is, um, in terms of um, things that need to be better, basically. And we thought Tamsin would be perfect. So pass over to Tamsin. Thank you very much. No pressure there. And don't be that introduction. Really. <laughs> uh, so my name is Tamsin Russell. As a visual description, I'm a middle-aged, white-skinned woman with dark, long hair, a blunt fringe, bright red lipstick and uh, black glasses. And I lead at Workforce um, at the Museums Association. And I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this volunteer panel. Having worked in the sector for over 20 years, um, <laughs> one thing I know is that often we make assumptions around what our people need, whether that be uh, staff, freelancers, communities, and also volunteers, which is why I think it's always important at any of these events, we ensure that there are space and opportunities to hear from the people that are making the difference as opposed to what we think they are doing to make the difference. So in terms of the format for today, we've got time to hear from each of our volunteers on our panel and I'll introduce or they will introduce themselves very, very shortly and give a little bit of a, an overview of, of where they volunteer and also their experience of volunteering from their perspective. We have got some questions and I will be fielding those at that point. Um, and I really would urge you to use Slido and to think about the questions either generically for all of these people on the, the panel and also um, online. If there is a specific question you'd like to ask, please sort of name check that person so we can make sure that we can uh, make the most of, of their insight and experience. So I'm going to, first of all, welcome Bertol Njida, who is sitting here and is going to be talking about his experience. So over to you. Hi there. Um, my name is Belfort because I'm from Dumbo Radio. I'm a multilingual uh, presenter. I present um, a radio show called the, the Music Request Show, and it's all about um, engaging with the African um, and Caribbean community at large. And it's more to do with uh, taking requests, music requests from from the audience and playing them on the radio and not only playing the music, but trying to interact with them to find out what are the issues that's going out, uh, that's um, the issues that are happening within the African and Caribbean community and try to, to solve them using various languages. And I, I do that through music as well. So that's what I do at the Jumbo Radio. Fantastic. And what um, has been your experience? Obviously, we've already heard from George. Uh -huh. It's an amazing organisation to volunteer for. But has there been any challenges specifically for, for you in terms of engaging with that work? Yeah, there's been uh, a few challenges. And one of the challenges, like um, George said, was uh, languages. Languages was uh, was quite a big was, uh, a big barrier because um, I speak uh, a few languages. I speak French. I speak English, I speak Spanish, I speak Italian, and I speak Pigeon English, it's got Pigeon English. And so uh, during my show, there are people who um, want to request music. And then sometimes you get uh, young people who are as young as uh, 16 years old, and they say they want to listen to music from maybe a kind of Swahili kind of music. And if you can't play that, they, they get angry. And then you have to find a way to get someone else who's going to come and help them to, you know, to understand what's what's really what's really going on at the at the radio. So language was really a big barrier um, at the at the radio station. Thank you. I'm going to go to um, uh, a D two two um, online. So over to you. Just give us a little bit of an outline of, of your volunteering experience and uh, a little bit around the role that you do in the organisation you volunteer for. I think you're on mute though. Yeah. Thank you. I know. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my name is Ade Tutu. Yeah, I volunteer with uh, Scottish Refugee Council as the Refugee Re um, Festival Rep. I also volunteer with uh, Refugee and with um, uh, Refugee Action. So I've been volunteering for like maybe close to two years now. 
And um, if I say I have any challenges, I wouldn't say per se, but if it's discussing with other people about the role of volunteering and what challenges they are faced, is more of not maybe having the clarity on what is expected and what they can get. That now if you're volunteering and if any volunteering from any organization, the organization should be able to tell or to expressively say, this is what I can support you with. This is what you we can do. And because um, let's say, for example, I'm volunteering for a charity that helps migrant, yeah? And a volunteer comes in, wants to volunteer for one reason or the other, because they want to go out, they want to own their skills, they want to learn, they want to network, but at the back of their mind, they also need support. So when they get to see people being supported and they have this expression of, uh, okay, you're volunteering, it, we can do this or we can do that, but they're also doing it for other people. Sometimes it's that it dampens their energy to do more or to want to do this when they're also in need of that same support. So um, basically challenges from my own end, I've not had any per se, but from interacting with other volunteers, this is one of the things that's talk about. And it also has to do with their mental health as well. So uh, no, it's not really, there's no fast, fast rule to it. It's just learning to know how to communicate to your volunteers and having like an agreement or understanding between volunteers and organizations that says, okay, this is what I can do. This is what I can do. More of supportive. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come back to you shortly with some other questions. I'm going to come to Paul now. So, Paul, we've already heard a little bit around your experience, but just uh, wondered whether there were any specific um, aspects that have supported your ability and, and opportunities to participate in the volunteering space. Um, one of the the best things about the volunteer stuff I do with GDAs is because of the relationships I've built up with them. They kind of they put me to work. You know, they they, they know my talent, my skills, my, mm -hmm. my areas of. Uh, oh, let me just get to the end. But they know I can talk. So. We're a good company. Yeah. I'm slightly closer. So they um you'll find things a lot of the time. It's not just because of my visual impairment, but it's definitely a skill I have. You know, it's uh, chatting recently. I've, I've been the uh, facilitator slash host of a couple of podcasts, um, just because they know uh, I'll just, I'll, you know, do a bit of what you're doing the new kind of thing, where I'll jump in, ask questions, keep the flow going, have a bit of banter, have, you know, the jokes cracking. And yeah, they kind of, they're quite good at vetting people as well. So a lot of what we've talked about today in terms of what organisations get in touch, wanting to get more disabled people involved, but if they don't have a budget for the bit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Then a lot of things will not get through, you know, they will not get passed on. Um, because I think GDA recognise they don't, people like me, you know, I'll, I feel there's a pressure to give back to my community to, to do as much as I can and uh, I, I do endeavour to be useful. <laughs> but, you know, they'll vet stuff, which I find quite good. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's just having that recognition of, of the skills of the things I've got uh, in my locker that, that they can you know, take advantage of. I want that. I want I want to be put front and centre and, and be useful, you know. And um, yeah, so I think that's been the biggest thing of, of actually identifying the, the skills that somebody has. I know your volunteers completely. Wonderful. Yeah. And yeah, as you know, I've been uh, volunteering for gate dogs as well, uh, fundraising. And if he continues the dog doing what he's doing, then I'll probably volunteer for the prison service soon as well. <laughs> I have the most remarkable view that you should all be jealous of at the moment. <laughs> Wonderful Paul. I'm going to come to Helen. Hi, welcome, Helen. Um, so again, just outline very briefly um, uh, who you are and, and what your role is and and yeah, any uh, experiences you'd like to share? My name's Helen, and I've been volunteering at Edinburgh Zoo, an engagement volunteer since the summer of 2022. 
Um, I'm autistic, I've got ADHD and I'm hypermobile. And some of the challenges around me is around communication. But I can talk back to it's the social side of things I can't do. And um, I've had to be told to, that it's okay to take a break mm -hmm. and to not do things. Mm -hmm. um, because I've, I've got a uh, tend to push myself. But um, enjoying the volunteering through the mental health aspect of things. And I've been making some of that patients of my own that I know what I need and that it just um, I know that I can tell Ali or that and then she'll go along with it. <laughs> Sometimes most of the time. <laughs> 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 <There's only> <laughs> so obviously now the challenge for me, main challenge for me, is because the hypermobility's got worse and it's known to, it's linked to autism now for some <laughs> um it's like getting around. Mm -hmm. So I know roughly what, when I can and can't, it's sort of weather related and what I can do and not do. Really encouraging around organisations creating a space for you to make those adaptations and for you to say what you need and for them not to project what they think that you need. It's always my advice around following, following the lead and following the insight and experience of the person. So you know yourself best. Don't you? So yeah. make sure that we're supporting you. So it's like some some cases, like it's a simple thing to like being able to write stuff down to, and then I use like a laminate apps and use the benchmark things off of, and then I've got a whiteboard and a black book book thing that I've got in my bag, and then I use like things I've got a few thirty toys that are like the sale brands, <laughs> and then I managed to get things like these cards, which help. Because they help explain things when you talk when I can't. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open out to the questions very, very shortly. Um, uh, but while we are just waiting, I just wondered if I could, could ask a, a question of, of, of all of you, so both in person and also online. Um, what would you say to somebody that, that you know, in terms of inclusion, we've been talking about different people and different groups that are uh, excluded or unrepresent, underrepresented or, or under participants within volunteering in our sector. What would you say to somebody who might be thinking uh, about volunteering in heritage? What would you tell someone? How could we attract them? Um, and I'm going to come to Paul first. Uh, that's a tough one. So you you you're asking how would we, if I was to speak if I was speaking to somebody that works that is trying to attract volunteers or the volunteer themselves. So imagine I good good clarification. I'm not being clear. So imagine I'm a volunteer of somebody who's thinking about volunteering. To bring, yeah. I might come from a variety of different backgrounds. So I might have a disposed disability. Uh, I might have um, uh, different preferences. A whole raft of different things. How would you? What would you tell I'm me? Asking, you know, know what you need and then stick by it. I think there's sometimes a lot of people, um, they want to volunteer and they'll, uh, me in the early days, maybe I would um, put myself into difficult situations, trying to find location or, you know, things like that, where I really felt uncomfortable uh, because I didn't, feel strong enough maybe or, or it was my right to say this mm -hmm. is what you should mm -hmm. be putting in place for me to you know make this happen uh, I guess seeing the standards being set I don't mean to keep coming back to it but I don't know any other organisation like Glasgow Disability Alliance and it makes a big difference as I was thinking about this in preparation for today the, just the other day the, the, the level of anxiety and apprehension is so fundamentally different on a day that I wake up and I'm going to volunteer for Group A or GDA. GDA, I wake up, know what's happening. I know somebody's got to be at the door to meet me off the taxi. Uh, there's going to be PAs kicking about all day. It's not just the fact I've established relationships. This is just a given. This is They've got a good reputation <laughs> that they've, they've built up. Uh, so I would say, yeah, know what you need and, and kind of push for it. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm going to come to um, Bertel. So what would you say? So if someone was saying, oh, I'm thinking of volunteering for the Radio Jambo, uh, but I'm a little bit anxious about it, what would you tell them? 
Um, first of all, um, what I'll tell the organization first is um, to think about advertising. If you advertise the right way, uh, using the right choice of words, uh, you might end up attracting the, the right people as well. So I think the the, the, the organi organizations should come together and create um, strong bonds, partnerships that could uh, attract people, especially from ethnic minorities like, like mine. Um, and you have to think about um, putting value on the, the people who want to come and kind of like thinking about uh, creates uh, creating some kind of funding mm -hmm. for people because funding is something that might uh, help the people who want to uh, get involved to say okay at least here yeah, there's funding at least they can like so we're complaining about transportation mm -hmm. that's the that's the least thing that uh, someone who wants to volunteer want your organization to do for them so if that's something you can help out with I think that's uh, uh, probably why uh, someone from any background who wants mm -hmm. to volunteer for you. And like uh, he said, knowing what you want as well is part of it. If you know exactly what you want, you go to the right places you get and you get what, you, what you need. Yeah, so understanding of that fit, that's a really good yeah. good reflection, yeah. those barriers. Thank you. I'm going to come to online. I feel like I'm doing the Eurovision Song Contest. Is there going to be no Or you OK? Oh, I was just going to hear Perfect. from Adita and then we'll come to you. Is that OK? okay? Yes. Um, uh, Adipu, any, uh, what would you say to somebody who wants to volunteer but uh, has got anxiety about it or a little apprehensive about it? Okay, yeah, I got the question. Um, what I will say, the first, the first thing I will tell the person is, do you believe in the vision of that organisation? As in, do you know which organisation you want to volunteer with and do you believe in their vision? Because if you're just doing volunteering because I want to get out of the house or because I want to upskill or something, and the organization doesn't provide that, you there will be a frustration setting in. So it's basically like two things. The organization you're going to, do you believe in their vision? Do you believe in what they do or what they stand for? Then two, do you understand what they can provide? And that's if that is cleared, then whatever the person goes in to see or expecting, it will be like it won't be negative experience at the end of the day, because I am it's like you are working with the organization to get to make them achieve their purpose and not because I just want to volunteer because I want a boss pass or because I want to get support or because I want to make friends, but it's after they go beyond that. Wonderful, thank you. I love that belief in that vision. I think um, there's some employees also that can hear, hear that uh, mode. Uh, so who these have me on? Uh, Slido. Okay, so lots of busy things coming through the Slido here, and there's a really great um, question here in terms of red flags. So if you were browsing, we have the Make Your Mark Volunteer Recruitment Portal that is a free portal that is effectively trying to create a marketplace for people interested in volunteering with Heritage to try and make it as easy as possible. So if you were on there and you were uh, doing a bit of window shopping, is there any red flags? So if you saw something and you were just like, uh -uh, what would that, what sort of, what would an example of a red flag possibly be? I'll pick that if you want. Yep. Yeah. Uh, if, if I go into say the website or um, their, their contact details, these can I see if they don't work with my voiceover, they don't work with my screen reader, my software, so that I can access them. That's fine, did it the first hurdle for me, mm -hmm. right there. If they're not putting in the book for that kind of side of things, how am I going to be able to communicate, connect with them properly? That's the, uh, I'm, I'm probably go with that. Um, well, a little layer down the line, like an example I gave earlier, if, they, if they're late, they turn up late, then they don't value me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but like what the person online just said is, if they don't already have an idea, a vision, see if I get the sense that it's it's their job to find people, and that's it. It's no, they're, they're not keen. It's it's one thing just to be told to go and do it, but they actually need to want to do it. They need to want me in, involved, and it's not a box ticking exercise. If I get into that from anywhere, then then I'm out. Okay, thank you. To anyone else? Yeah, Helen, she want anything around red flags around? Volunteering. Yeah, can I see? 
Absolutely. We want to hear from you. Yeah, uh, for me, when I go to a company, I just, if they don't have like a social media presence, like no Twitter updates, nothing of what they're doing, no uh, activity or um, of what or whatsoever they're doing, then it's a red flag because you, you're supposed to be doing something. You're supposed to be communicating to people what you're doing. So if there's no updated uh, activity or if their website was last updated like three years ago or something like that, then that's a big no, no. Yeah. OK, so another one uh, coming through the slide, there's a theme around uh, uh, barriers that are in place. Now, I'm not sure if we have panel members who have experienced volunteering within the heritage sector and, um, you know, built heritage, natural and tangible cultural um, archives, etc. But if there is any possible trends or repetitive barriers that are experienced within our sector. So I'm wondering, is there volunteers who have done much volunteering in within heritage environment? Helen? Okay, I think. Oh, it's nothing there, but so there's the other stuff, there's other places I get to talk to people. So it doesn't actually make it 100% a barrier. It just limits. Yeah. Okay. So is that around about that we need to understand? So, so for instance, a castle was deliberately built you know, 800 years ago to be inaccessible, which makes it very hard. And we need to do all the reasonable adjustments in advance and understand those adjustments rather than making the adjustments when someone volunteer wants to volunteer. It's about being ready and understanding those in advance. Is that? Yeah. 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 OK, then. Um, so there's a question here that's very popular. How can an organisation support volunteers who have not shared that they have additional needs when asked, um, but um, would require those adjustments uh, made at the time? So with that question around the individuals joining an organisation where they either don't disclose or don't have requirements at that point, but the requirements are come to light over the course of time is that what you're asking that yeah right? yeah I, th I think it's the best way I, th I think the question is around the best way to have a conversation where somebody is um i think ready to volunteer and, and they've had that the, the conversations but haven't um chatted about any support needs and adjustments that an organization might need to have and then come to start volunteering i think it's around about Kind of what is the best um, approach to to um, support those conversations and I think understand what the adjustments would be. Um, I think Paul it's what you were saying sometimes that you'll turn up for volunteering and people haven't actually put in place adjustments and support um, for you um, and obviously that's a very negative experience for you so I suppose it's about if that if those circumstances happen how best do people on the day you know support that? Um, well yeah, there's a bit of give and take from both sides, though, isn't there? You don't want somebody turning up or, uh, you know, kicking off when they've been given every opportunity to communicate the stuff. You know, there's some things you, you can't communicate until you're there. Maybe you need to read the room, you need to read the, the premises, work out. Stuff comes up, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's just, a bit of, it's just about um, being a bit more relaxed about that, working together, isn't it? You yeah. know, you have the basics in place. You know, like we talked about earlier, being up front, it's our stairs. You can take it, you know, you're, you're trying to take care of as much information as possible, but it is going to be very difficult. You just need to be agile enough on the day to have a conversation and, and pivot and move on whatever you need to. But again, as I say, it's not just because every one of your communications, Rosie, I'm sure said if you have any access needs, get in touch. Yeah. Giving the person every opportunity to do that. If something drops up on the day, you know, as I said, give and take the I wouldn't walk up expecting everything to be taken care of and be carried in on a plinth and you know, just <laughs> like, I, I need to be flexible as well and I need to work at, at coming up with solutions to, you know, in fact, I enjoy it, I like it, yeah. Yep. Okay, um, there's a question here um, around about tokenism 
um, if anyone's ever felt that their experience has been tokenism, and I guess it's that, um, yeah, D do you have any thoughts that you want to share with the room and how to absolutely avoid that scenario? Great question. Thank you, whoever yeah. asked that. I'll face on Sarah Mount, but I've, I've spoke a lot, as I say, yeah. that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just rephrase the question. Have you ever experienced or felt that you've been um, appointed to be a volunteer or engaged in an organisation purely because they want to be seen to be doing the right thing and they want to be seen to be being diverse? <laughs> <laughs> right, so definitely, uh, is, that, is that something that's going to affect uh, Edita? What's your laugh tell us all about this? No, no, that's that's personally the question just uh, kind of brought the Google <laughs> out of my mind <laughs> because I know because there's some companies now they're like uh, their community social responsibility is to like give some department or some employees the right to go volunteer with something and they put it as mental health week or something like that. So um, <laughs> if that's the case, I. Uh, well, the thing is, if if it's going to really help the company to feel better by maybe allowing their um, employees to volunteer, but it has to do with volunteers, the employees as well. So it um, it's more of how do you how do you like weigh your social responsibility? How do you weigh your community social responsibility? Really. Uh, to me, volunteering has to come with the volunteers itself. So it's not because the company is allowing you to go somewhere or the company is giving you a free time to just play around or something like that. So uh, basically, if it's a rule now that um, employers are supposed to give in some time or some hours in their work to volunteering, then I guess maybe it's supposed to be like a partnership with the organization. It's okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, that whole idea of corporate social responsibility yeah. and volunteering and what that looks like. And that might be an indicator that um, they're looking that way, but also adopting similar approaches internally. All right, I think we're coming to the end of the time. Yeah, yeah. We have got some amazing questions. Uh, and for me, what's been really interesting looking at the Slido questions is what that then leads me to think about what I would do in my professional practice. So whilst we haven't necessarily had the answers from the panels to all of the questions asked, we can ask answer those questions ourselves around what we would do differently and affect our professional practice. So that leads me just to say thank you so much to the panel for all of your reflections um, and also all of um, your insights from being here today. And thank you to everybody in the audience here and online. Um, I really would encourage you to speak to people and find out their views around anything rather than making assumptions. But I know that lunch is beckoning and I'm going to hand over to Rosie. Is there anything you need to say about lunch? Um, is there anything I need to say about lunch? Um, that's us. If you can come back at half past one, um, we get back on track in time for the next presenters and the workshop so anyone online please rejoin at half one um, lunch is out where you have found tea and coffee if you have told us about any dietary needs and um, there'll be specific plates um, assigned for that and there's also an allergens sheet um, out there so just uh, yeah go out help yourself um, I'll give another kind of five minute uh, warning um, and that is it um, and yeah the, the panelists and um, I believe are staying for lunch please just be I'm just going to say, please just be mindful of the panellists having needing a break and having lunch as well if you have got any questions. And again, just a reminder that Mikey is also working um, today. And please be mindful of that if you're wanting to approach and have a chat with Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.